thank Laura Gravel tonight for passing out lots and lots of flyers for tonight's meeting. So thank you, Laura. <laughs> and a special thanks to the um, Conifer Area Council Board of Directors um, for actually sponsoring tonight. Usually we have another sponsor sponsor, but we wanted to sponsor tonight. It's a very special night um, because we're dedicating the meeting to Dan Imning, an extraordinary volunteer. So tonight's kind of dedicated to Dan. Um, as most of you know, most of you have seen before, um, Conifer Area Council is a non-political, non-profit organization that does not support or oppose any development, issue, political agenda, individual person, or business. We've asked all of our speaker, speakers to include these values in their presentations and to be non-partisan, non-controversial, and to present just the facts. We also ask that you represent these values and there will be no campaigning or signing of petitions at the meeting. Also, there will be no questions or comments during the presentations. That way we can get through a lot, a lot of information. And then um, about 8 o'clock, you will have a chance to ask any questions that you might have. Okay. You might notice, any of you that normally come, Angela Hassan is not holding the time cards tonight. Um, she ha she's been quite sick and had some other things going. So Susie Nelson, another board member, will be in the back with her little time cards to keep everybody on track. <laughs> so what's going on around here? First of all, um, Steve Harrelson is normally here from CDOT. He had another meeting tonight. He'll definitely be here in November. Um, but he said there's not a whole lot going on with CDOT right now, uh, except that Shaper's Crossing was repaved yesterday, and um, a radar speed sign and delineator posts in the median will be installed shortly. So that intersection will be improved. And now I'd like to ask Erica Armstrong, CAC board member, to come up and give a little update about the development going on up here. Erica. So um, there are only just a couple of commercial development updates. Um, if you have one of these and you came in the door, they're also listed here. We're just trying to keep you informed of what's going on for applications in the community. Um, the most important one, we think, uh, tonight John Rydell is going to be presenting information about the community survey. That information is going to be blended into a meeting on the, uh, the 25th, uh, May 30th, 6.30, at the Conifer kind of Community Church. So if any of you took that community survey, we're going to take those results and discuss it with the county commissioners on that night and it's open for the community. That information is on the very back page. Then commercial developments, there's only two new applications. Um, the first one was denied. It was for the, uh, the TriStar Office Park Official Development Plan that was on Renault Street. And the second one um, was, is still in discussion on Iowa Gulch Road. It's a meeting to discuss the possible rezoning to allow for up to 22 single family residential lots and a recreational facility. And they have Ski Hill listed there. So we're trying to find out what's going on with that. They're having a public meeting on September 22nd at the Inner Canyon Firehouse. So we should have a little bit more information at the next meeting. The other updates are, there's a bit of change over the Clifton House, if you know where that is, right at 285. They're now using it as a private K-8 school. And the Compassionate Dharma Monastery, they got rezoned from A-2 to P-2 to allow for overnight states of congregation. So that's it for the updates. And if you want any more information about the stuff that we put in here, you can also find more details. If you look at the very back, back page, there's a website you can go to. It's planning.jeffco.us. So when you see those little yellow signs on your neighbor's property, you want to find out about it, you can just go there and find out what they're trying to do with the property change. That's it for tonight. Thank you, Erica. Okay, there's not much going on around here about RTD also, um, but Bruce wanted us all to know, obviously, that the big news is the recent opening of Denver Union Station. So if anybody gets a chance, go down there and see it. It's pretty cool. Um, 
like I said, there's nothing, nothing too much going on around here. Um, maybe at the net November meeting, he'll have an update. And now we're going to have um, Sharon Trope talk just a minute about the Conifer Area Chamber and what's going on there. Sharon. Thank you, Shirley. Hello, everyone. How are you tonight? Good. Excellent. All right, so we have a few events going on that I hope that you can put in your calendar and attend. The first one is our um, fifth annual Octo Beer Fest. It will be this Thursday at Brooks Place Tavern from 4 to 7 p.m. And it will feature 15 breweries with at least two beers each to try. The cost is $25, and you can get your tickets right now either at Brooks Place Tavern or Morris Evergreen Auto Body or at Biggie's Liquor, or you can get them at the event with walking in the door if they still have some space left. We're hoping it's going to be great weather so we can be outside on the patio. Um, next, we have, um, this is actually organized by Lauren Drabble, again with the Concrete Council, 25 Quarter Cash Mom on Friday, September 19th. So if you can make it to Stage Door Theater to see their funny, hilarious play, Dearly Departed, and then head over to Colorado's Best Beers, which is the bar that's in with the Denver Zipline Adventures. Um, they're going to stay open a little late for us so that we can hang out and kind of get to know each other. Um, if you can't make that, there is also a classical concert at Concord Community Church that night, and it will um, be featuring a classical pianist named Roger Grubach. He'll be playing Bach, Bach, Brahms, and Beethoven for the evening, and then you can head over to Colorado's Best Beers after that stuff. That starts at 7.30. Um, on Wednesday, September 24th, there's another 25 quarter cash mob starting at 3.30 in the afternoon, and this one's at Mountain Books, so if you haven't stopped by and seen Jesse, please pop in. He's a wonderful resource, carries a lot of local authors. So you can head there and then stop next door after that to Pies by Bakers, which is a new place that just opened. They've got coffee, pies, cookies, and it's just a great place to hang out. It's where um, Murrow's, Monroe's used to be. The Murrow's, the old Italian restaurant that was really good. Um, next, Public Affairs Committee um, of the Conference Chamber. We have scheduled the Jefferson County Commissioner candidates and the Jefferson County Sheriff's candidates to come up and answer a series of questions and be open and available for questions from you on October 6th, starting at 6 p.m. at the Elk Creek Fire Station while on Blackfoot Road. And they'll each have about 45 minutes, so we'll go till about 8 o'clock that night. And then holiday wine tasting for the future is on Saturday, November 22nd and that's at the Evergreen Memorial Barn, and it's going to be all day. We'll have a silent auction open, and then starting at 4.30, we'll have our decadent desserts, holiday wine tasting, and festival treats. I hope you can make that, because it's always a magical evening. And then last, but not least, our Conifer Christmas Parade is on December 6th, and it will be a theme of around the world this year. So we're looking forward to having a lot of floats, having our Christmas markets again, and hopefully, hopefully have some fun games for the kids as well. So hope you can make it. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon. You know, it was around the world about 25 years ago or something like that, because my kids, I um, actually pulled a float with about 25 kids. They were all dressed in around the world costumes, so they had all these great costumes. It was really fun. What comes around goes around, I guess. Um, okay, next is a legislative update, and um, we couldn't get our legislators again here tonight. They either have classes or something going. Um, elections obviously are coming up quickly, so you'll need to kind of figure out who you're going to be voting for there. Um, last week, the oil and gas panel was appointed, and they had their first meeting. So um, that's going to be a big topic for this coming year. Oil and gas will probably be the predominant issue um, for this coming year. Um, okay, next we have John Riddell, another Conifer Area Council board member who is going to be talking a little bit about the Conifer Community Survey and the findings that we have come up with. Um, so, John. Thank you, Shirley. Hello, everybody. Hi, John. Come on now. How many want to hear, get a sneak peek at our survey findings? Woohoo! <laughs> well, um, we did a survey in April and May. Uh, it's something that we do about every four years. And um, this year, though, the survey was um, conducted for kind of a very special reason. And that is that the county 
is updating our Conifer for Community Plan. You probably are aware of this. This is our Conifer for Community Plan. And um, they are editing and updating. And we wanted to make sure that we had strong input into that plan in terms of what Conifer residents need, what they like, what they don't like. And so that is uh, the main reason we did the survey and we organized it around the uh, table of contents of this plan. If you don't have a plan, uh, by the way, I think we have copies surely somewhere. If we, yeah, if, if we don't have them tonight, if you want a copy, we can get you a copy. So I want to give you a, just a real quick peek at some of the initial findings. Uh, and we'll have a report that will probably be out uh, hopefully by the end of this month. We have a lot of work to do yet. I also want to thank a few people. This is a pretty big undertaking to do. Uh, Shirley Johnson and uh, Erica Armstrong, Carol Ziller, all played a big role in helping to make this happen. So thank you to, to all of you. Uh, uh, so how many of you got a survey and completed it? I knew it. I figured just about every single person here would have. Thank you for doing that. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through four minutes or so, some preliminary findings. We call it the Conifer 285 Quarter Community Area Plan. That's what the county calls this plan of ours. Um, who wants to know us about us? I mentioned we really wanted to have input for Jefferson County Planning as they're editing and updating the plan. But, um, you know, things are changing all the time. Our demographics change. That's one of the things I'm going to show you in a sneak peek here in a few minutes. And this kind of information can be used by a lot of groups. If you're a business and you're, this kind of information will be helpful to you. Or if you run a not-for-profit, not um, this will interest you, I think. And we will send the report out to everyone who's on our email list. So if you, want, if you uh, aren't on our email list and want to get a report, you might want to get that to us tonight at the end of the, at the, end of the night. Um, so Erica put these slides together for me. Thank you, Erica. No death by PowerPoint. Um, I always love the way she crafts ideas. The, the, the survey was 42 questions long. We did get feedback from people, disgruntled people, angry people, who said, what are you doing? Um, we, we asked for an awful lot of information, and we really appreciate that most of you went through the whole survey and, and gave us your input. We had 1,200 respondents. Um, and so, as I mentioned, I'll give you just a few highlights. I'm going to look at my notes because I was thinking about this and there, I don't want to miss, I had a few useful thoughts and I don't want to miss them. This gives you an idea of the age distribution. We asked what your ages were and this is what we found that 54% um, of the people who filled out the survey are 55 years of age or older, 55, 54%. In Jefferson County, um, that percentage is 35 percent. So one of the things we've learned already is the folks who filled out our survey uh, tend to be on the older side, like me. And it was one of the issues that we had. We were really trying to get to the younger population in our community. We still want to do that. We may even end up doing uh, another poll or survey of the, of the schools. Uh, so the people who fill this out are people who are um, in uh, my age category. And then we looked at, uh, at gender. And of course, the women beat us again. It, I think it's, it's pretty much true of uh, surveys that women are the ones who kind of take the bull by the horns and the ones who, who respond. 60% of the respondents to the survey were women, 39.40% or so were men. What's interesting is in Conifer, according to the census, 49% of the population is women. So you can see that um, we're way more resembled by women. What might that mean in terms of responses? I don't know. How long have you lived in Conifer? Um, I have a note on this. Uh, those of us who lived here 10 years or longer, 64%. So 64% of us who've been here 10 years or longer filled out the survey. But there are a lot of people who haven't here, lived here that long, and we didn't hear from them. And that's another issue for us. We really want to get to those folks who haven't lived in the community long. We want to hear their voice, and we want to know what, what they're interested in as well. Um, family status, we tend to be a, a married community. 
85% of people who filled out the survey are, are married or a couple. And only 15% are single. And uh, I thought work status was interesting uh, primarily because of the, the second number. 23% of the people who filled out the survey are retired. And um, when, you, when we look at the survey from four years ago, one of the things we noticed, and this will be in the report, is that the age of us who are filling out the survey and the length of residency are all going up, which kind of says that people come to Conifer and stay. People aren't coming in and leaving. Um, and we have 23% of those who completed this are retired. And that plays out in a, another couple of questions. In terms of number in the household, they tend, they tend to be small households, though. 53% of us, two people, 10% have one person in the household. So that means 63% of us, uh, either it's a one-person household or a two-person household. So not, not big families up here. Um, and just a couple more slides, quickly. What do you think are the most pressing issues up here? And this is what people said, what we all said. Fire vulnerability is number one. Um, out of that 1,200, 700 people selected that, amongst others. Uh, preservation of our small town character and diminishing water supply. Those were the three, the three top items. And um, in looking at this, we thought, well, fire vulnerability, we do talk about that a lot. We have presentations at our town hall meetings about that. So we're kind of paying attention. In terms of preserving our small town character, that's something I think that uh, kind of for every council has really been working on a lot, and we continue to do that. And diminishing water supply, I don't. We have had people talk about that, but I don't know how much time and attention we're, we're paying to that. So that's something we'll be looking into as we analyze the findings. What else could we be doing in that area? Um, and this was really kind of striking to me. We asked people what kinds of housing they think Conifer has. Uh, are there housing? Uh, are there houses of all types and dwellings of all types? Enough of those, not enough of those. And those people who said there aren't enough different types of housing, 26.7% um, said we need more senior housing. Now we don't know exactly what that means. Is that being assisted living, or does that mean just townhouses are kind of set up nicely for us as we grow older? But it's probably something that, as a council, we'll pay some attention to figure out what does that mean for us and what can we do to, um, to figure out ways to get uh, people to build these kinds of uh, houses here. My wife and I would love to stay in Conifer. I'd love to see a townhouse development, a really nice townhouse development. So uh, as I get older, I don't have to take care of a two-acre yard anymore. All right. Uh, and then finally, what activities could be introduced or improved? And you can see the top three are a community center for indoor activities, uh, hiking trails, and that's kind of neat because you know, we are working on hiking trails. We're very active in that. We've entered our second phase of that. And uh, our recreational indoor activities, gymnastics and fitness. So number one and three are kind of similar. So those are the kinds of things that a pretty significant population of us said is important. That's uh, kind of a sneak peek. Hopefully, end of the month, we'll have a report. We'll send it out uh, by email to all of you. And if you want to um, um, ask any questions about that, have any other questions, I'll be around afterwards. If you did submit it, if you, if you aren't getting our mailings by, by email, let me know. I'll get you on the list, and you'll automatically get a report. Thank you. Thank you, John. We will have a lot more information about the survey, so um, stay tuned on that. And um, the next Confer 25 quarter area plan update meeting, and I think this has already been mentioned, but it's um, next Thursday, September 25th. Um, it's actually not 6.39 to 8.39. It's 6.30 to 8.30. Typo. Sorry about that. Um, at the Conifer Community Church. Okay? So anybody that wants to be involved in that Conifer Community Plan update, very important. One thing at the last meeting they were trying to 
do was do a um, kind of a generalized thing about lighting. Well, what we like up here as far as lighting and what they like in town as far as lighting, two totally different things. So we, I think, talked them into keeping a section about lighting and, you know, that it should be night skylighting and, and things like that. Very important that you come to those meetings and really hear what they have to say and get your voice in. Okay, well, we have a great hot topic tonight. Um, global warming and our local climate. And we've got Mike Setnich, our local weather geek, who is going to explain where our local weather is affected by cli um, changing climate. So, Mike. Thank you, Shirley. Good evening, everybody. Um, Shirley mentioned we can't have a controversial topic, so I'm going to try to present this in a light that is non-controversial, hopefully kind of the facts and stuff like that. Um, lower left picture, anybody happen to know where that is? Any guesses? Icy place south of the equator. So uh, that, that's a picture in Antarctica. And the reason I bring it up is that some of the data I'm going to present to you tonight, some of the ice core data that we use for kind of climate history of our planet comes from Antarctica. So I thought that was appropriate. And the other one's just a fun shot my buddy ripped there. That was his first tornado he's ever seen. So he was very excited about that. Rip, uh, strangely enough, is an ex-Air uh, Force colonel who is in the Special Forces branch of the Air Force and as a meteorologist, which is kind of rare. And uh, Rip did some interesting things like halo jumping, which is jumping out of an airplane at 40,000 feet, pulling the chute at about 5,000 feet at night behind enemy lines. So when people ask me, you know, I wish I had your job, you know, you, you can be 50% right and, and still get paid. And my comment back to them is usually if I batted 500 in the majors, I'd make a whole lot of money. So what I'm going to talk to you tonight about real quickly, I don't have much time, and this is a fairly complex topic, but it's really climate and weather. What is the difference between the two? And really, from a standpoint, weather is that day-to-day -day stuff that we experience on a daily basis. Do we have to put our coats on today? It's going to rain. Are we going to have thunderstorms? Are we going to have snow? And climate is really the long-term averages of weather for a specific region or the entire planet over a period of time. So that time can be the record that we've been keeping records for weather and observations, which is about one in 200 years, or it can be a much longer period of time, like the history of our planet, you know, four and a half billion years. So we're, we're going to try to explain what that difference is. The Earth has been through some very dramatic climatic changes in its history. Over that four and a half billion period, the, the Earth has been completely ice covered at times, as well as completely free of ice. And so where do we stand today? What's going on with our climate? And kind of how does that influence our local weather? So how many understand that we're currently in an ice age right now? How many knew that? OK, a few. Yeah, so the Earth today is in an ice age. It's called the Quaternary Ice Age. It's been going on for about two and a half million years. Uh, we are currently in what's called an interglacial period of that ice age. That means we're in a warm phase of the Ice Age. So that's why our, our climate today is actually quite comfortable for human activity. I mean, we have snow on the poles, we get snow in the mountains, we're warm around the equator. It's actually a pretty nice time to live on this planet. But we've been through some very dramatic changes uh, over this period of the Earth. We've had four major Ice Ages in the history of the Earth that we kind of know about. Um, and some of them have been where the Earth has been completely ice covered. Um, and so that would not be a real good time to, to kind of exist on this planet. So the data up here I'm going to show you on the top, uh, this is our, our temperature pattern. And it's been derived, again, from these ice core samples. So there's a little bit of controversy how you derive that information. It's using isotopes and different things that they see in the ice cores. And then you try to correlate that to temperature. But if you notice, you know, 500 and some odd million years ago, the current time on the right-hand side there, the Earth has been very warm at times, and it's been very cold at times. So you notice where we are in the current time up there, we're actually in a fairly cool period, and that's because we're in an ice age. But we look back, there have been periods where the Earth has been much warmer than we are today, and also much cooler. Down below is the list of ice ages that the Earth has been through. Again, the Quaternary Ice Age, that's that present one. 
And we notice that these ice ages last generally a couple hundred million years. So we've been in the current ice age two and a half million years. We probably are going to be in that for a while longer. Some other data. So this data, again, this is from Antarctica up at the top here. This is the Vostok uh, Center run by the Russians. And the core data, you see the current time is on the far left, and we go back 450,000 years. And, and so this is all during this Quaternary Ice Age, but you'll notice during this period, there have been times where the Earth has been quite warm, and then it cools off quite a bit. So the warm periods are those interglacial periods I talked about. The cold periods would be your glacial periods. 12,000 years ago was the last glacial period that we know that we had on the Earth. And during that time, the ice sheets came down over North America and were anywhere from three to 5,000 feet thick. So pretty hard to exist uh, in, in that thick of a, a nice period. Now the hot topic recently is human activity. What has human activity been done you know, to, our, to our planet's climate? Well, if we look over the last 130 years, really the, the time period that we have a lot of good observations, you'll notice that there's been a warming trend. And so we take, but you notice the scale, it's also less than a degree Celsius during that time period, but there's definitely been a warming trend. So why is that? Well, it's really hard to tell if that's natural processes, part of this evolutionary climate change we have, or has human activity contributed to that warming. And that's the part that we, we have theories about, but we don't really have any hard evidence, because it's really hard to go back in time and see what played into those warming and cooling periods. So there are other things that influence climate change on the planet. And the, the, one of the primary factors is something called Milankovitch cycles. And Milankovitch was a Serbian scientist that theorized that there are different things in the Earth's orbit, the tilt of the Earth, as well as the wobble in the Earth that can cause very dramatic climate changes on the Earth. And when all three of these factors kind of are in phase or out of phase, those tend to be periods where we have either a very a deep ice age or a very warm period. Right now we're in a period where they're kind of playing against each other a little bit. And that's why the climate is fairly fairly nice right now. Solar cycles are another thing, the solar radiation are coming in. We know that solar activity varies and that obviously can vary the, the heating impact to the earth. Volcanic eruptions, when there's very large volcanic eruptions, that volcanic ash goes up in the stratosphere, it stays for a very long time, and it can actually cool down the planet quite a bit, quite a bit. Meteor impacts, we know that there have been large meteor impacts on the Earth, and when those occur, they can also cause very large shifts in climate. And last, the one that gets all the kind of notoriety today are greenhouse gases. So we know when greenhouse gases increase in the Earth's atmosphere, mostly in the troposphere, the lowest part of the atmosphere, it retains a lot of the heat of the Earth. The heat doesn't get to escape, so that tends to warm the planet up. We also know, many, many years ago, through these uh, ice core samples, that there were also high levels of greenhouse gases. So the Earth has natural processes that create that, and we know also, as humans, we've contributed a great deal to that, especially over the last 100 years. This is kind of what Milankovitch cycles look like. The Earth has different orbits around the sun. When it tilts more away from the sun, it gets cooler. When it tilts forward, different hemispheres. But that's kind of the graphic of what those look like. So how does climate impact the weather? So we know the current climate, again, is very comfortable. A, a warmer planet tends to imply that we have more dramatic weather. When you have more energy in the atmosphere because of that heat, warmer oceans, we tend to have more dramatic weather. So we have uh, more active precipitation cycles and, and bigger floods. We have more intense drought cycles in different parts. It can lead to more tropical cyclone activity and things like that. When we have a cooler planet, obviously there's more ice, there's less dramatic weather. It tends to just promote getting cooler and cooler, and that's how the ice ages proceed in the glacial period stay for a long time. So what are influences to our weather? We've talked about climate influences, but from a weather standpoint, this is the thing that we're living on a day-to-day -day basis. What are the biggest impacts or influencers to our current weather? And one of the biggest ones is something called the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And what that is, it's really a sloshing back and forth. If you think of the Pacific Ocean as a big bathtub, 
There's warm water on one side and cool water on the other. And that warm water sloshes back and forth. When that warm water is in the eastern side of the Pacific, we call that the warm phase or an El Nino phase of the Enzo pattern. When that warm water is on the western side and the cool water is on the eastern side, we call that La Nina, the opposite of that. We also have neutral phases where the temperature patterns are fairly consistent across the Pacific. And the temperature difference is in this half degree Celsius range. Those are the sea surface temperature anomalies or the deviations from normal. So this is a graphic that shows you the three different phases of EMSO. Up on the top there is our warm phase, that's El Nino. So you notice that red indicates the warmer water. And you notice on the eastern side of that, on the right hand side of that upper graph, on the low side, is all that warm water. So that's the El Nino phase, that warm water is in the eastern Pacific. The middle graphic is La Nina. So that's the cool water phase in the eastern Pacific. The warm water stays on the western side. And then we have the neutral phase, and that's what we've had the last two seasons here uh, across the United States, is a neutral phase. So that just means that the temperature anomalies are near average. So what happens during these different phases? So here's a schematic here. During the warm phase of the El Nino phase, what happens is the jet stream that comes across the Pacific tends to sag a little bit farther south, impact central to southern California, and those storms that come across there to continue across the desert southwest and impact Colorado, these upper lows that form to our south give eastern Colorado a nice upslope flow. That's when we get our big snowstorms, especially here in the foothills. So in an El Nino pattern, that jet stream tends to stay farther south. That tends to be when eastern Colorado gets quite a bit of snow. So if we look back at past years and records, especially here in the foothills, that's where we have our highest snow seasons. The rest of the country tends to be warmer and drier up in the northern tier states. It tends to be cooler and wetter along the Gulf Coast states. So here's a La Nina. So this is the opposite. What happens here, the jet stream tends to ride farther north in the Pacific, and it impacts the Pacific Northwest. So they get quite a bit of rain during the La Nina phase. And you'll notice the jet stream then comes down from the Northwest over Colorado. So our mountains get a fair amount of snow during the La Nina phase. That's when the, especially the northern mountains and central mountains get quite a bit of snow. On the eastern side of the divide, it tends to stay drier and windy and warmer. So La Nina phases for the foothills and the plains tend to be drier than normal, and we tend to have a lot of our Chinook and downslope winds during that La Nina phase. We also have more cold air outbreaks, especially in the northern part of the United States during that La Nina phase. So this is a graphic here. This goes back to 1950 when we started measuring ocean temperatures in the Pacific. And you notice the cycles. The upper half are the warm phases, or La Nina, I'm sorry, El Nino. The bottom half are the colder phases, so those are La Ninas. And you notice it's very cyclical. They tend to go back and forth year to year. But you also notice during certain decades that you'll have a predominance of one phase over the other. And that's associated with something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So we tend to have more either La Ninas or El Ninos during a 10 to 20 year period than we would season to season. But it just, again, kind of goes to the cycles uh, that we run through, not only in our climate, but in our day to day weather pattern. So how does ENSO impact kind of local snowfall? We talk about that. We tend to have higher snowfall here during our El Nino seasons. So on Conifer Mountain, which is where I live, and there's been somebody keeping records since 1993 there, so we have a decent number of years that we have records for, the average of snowfall is about 173 inches. During a, a warm phase of ENSO, or an El Nino situation, the average of snowfall goes up to 226 inches. And we've had six of those episodes in a 21-year uh, period. All six of them have had above average snowfall. So the probability of above average snowfall when we have an El Nino phase is very high. At least we haven't seen a year that's had an El Nino where we haven't had above average snowfall, at least here in the foothills. Now during the converse, during the La Nina phase, the average snowfall drops to about 152 inches. So well below average snowfall. And the neutral phases, which we've had seven of those, we've had eight of the La Ninas, 
Also, the average is 152 inches. So during our neutral and La Nina phases, we tend to have low average snowfall. So the big question, what's going to happen this year? So we always can't predict that in so very well. We just observe it. We get kind of observational data out in the Pacific. And so far this year, there's been a warming phase that's occurring out in the eastern Pacific. So all of the information right now is saying there's about, it was up as high as 85% probability. It's down now to about a 65% probability that we're going to have an El Nino. And it's going to be in the kind of weak kind of state. So from 0.5 to 1 degrees above average sea surface temperature. Um, but any El Nino tends to promote above average snowfall here. So right now, if I were to forecast, I would say we'd have above average snowfall for the coming snow season. And the, the range up on Conifer Mountain would some, be somewhere in 190 to 240 inches, assuming that that weak El Nino actually develops. So there's still a chance it won't, then kind of all bets are off. But uh, as we get closer and that El Nino stays there, we think that we'll have above average snowfall. And you can see the graph down here at the bottom. This is just kind of the zero is the neutral. Up above it is with the El Nino. All of the models are kind of saying that it's likely we're going to have that El Nino. So I'm going to be around after the uh, presentations here. If anybody would like to talk about anything weather related, I'd be more than happy to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was very interesting. I bet everybody's going to be lining up to talk to Mike. Um, we are going to have Brian Mosby with the Conifer Library come up for just a couple minutes and talk a little bit about the Conifer Library. Brian. Thank you. Uh, I just was going to uh, give you some idea of what's coming up. We have ongoing programs at the library. We also have some uh, special programs coming up. But first I wanted to give a big kudos to the community. Uh, every year we do a summer reading club. And with Jefferson County, they give us our goals for sign-ups and people who finish the summer reading club, kids, teens, and adults. Uh, with the support of the community and the schools, this year we were able to surpass both goals by quite a significant amount. Thank you so much. Uh, ongoing programs uh, for kids, we always have our story times and our baby times Saturday mornings. Uh, we're going to try something new also and have an afternoon story time starting tomorrow at 4 o'clock. They'll be theme based, uh, lots of games and songs and lots of fun there, and stories as well. Uh, we have a great Lego club going on. We typically have about 30 to 60 people right in the library. Families working on Legos and projects, lots of fun for all ages. Uh, for adults, we do have our book club that meets the last Tuesday of each month. Uh, award winning books, so uh, good discussions going on, some great choices there. If you're interested, I have flyers over on the table. Uh, let's see. Coming up November 18th, we have a high altitude baking program that was popular last time we had it about a year ago. Uh, so lots of good information if you're new to the area or if you just can't make that bread rise really well. Uh, she's full of information on that. Movies at the library, we have regular movies on Saturday afternoons. Uh, we also have teen movies the first Tuesday of each month. Uh, Halloween coming up, so I'm particularly excited about my list for October. And let's see, November 15th is International Games Day at your library. Fun for all ages, great family event. Uh, you know, games promote thinking skills uh, as far as some literacy, so we'll have card games, board games, video games, all sorts of things going on at the library that day. And let's see, coming up in the new year, uh, we're going to start doing a makerspace program. So if you're unfamiliar with that, I can talk more about that. But uh, kind of doing some hands-on projects, building some little gadgets and things like that all through the library. We'll be promoting that in the new year. And I'm working with the Evergreen Library right now to bring a local Denver author to the community to do a talk on his experiences in writing and publishing. And, uh, he's quite a character. So. I uh, appreciate all the help and support in the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Lots of good
great stuff. Next we have Jen Anderson, who is the Staunton State Park Park Manager, um, and she's going to be telling us, I think, some pretty great news. Jen. I was so excited when I saw the agenda for tonight because for the very first time it says great news at Staunton State Park. Usually I stand before you and it just says Staunton State Park update and I get the um, wonderful task of telling you we're not going to open on time and our budget was cut, we're not going to build what we wanted to build. But that's all changed. Um, on May 18, 2013, Staunton State Park opened to the public as Colorado's 42nd State Park. So we're almost 16 months into operating of Staunton State Park and some of the highlights the first official year of operation, we met and exceeded the estimated visitation of over 133,000 visitors annually. How many of you here contributed to that number? All right, nice. Everybody look around, whoever did not raise their hand, you guys need to come out. The leaves are changing. If you visited us last summer, you probably know that it was a hopping place crawling with lots of people. This summer's visitation definitely toned down a bit. It was much more manageable, a lot less gray hair. And I anticipate that our second year's annual visitation will be slightly lower than our first year's, which is pretty usual um, in comparison, comparing first and second year of operations for businesses. We have an amazing volunteer crew, if you guys haven't heard me already talk about them. They joined us in 2012 and assisted with pre preparations for opening. It was a group of 52 volunteers that donated over 16,000 hours to the park since 2012. Just recently, we trained a new crew of 43 new volunteers to join, um, join the group. They've hit the ground running, assisting with all sorts of programs and projects in the park. And the staff continues to work hard to meet our visitor needs and our operational needs at the park. We celebrated our first anniversary this year on May 18th with a living history event. The event included education, stories, and activities to share the rich and wonderful history about the park, the Staunton family, and the surrounding community. Our goal is to make this an annual celebration. In addition, our volunteers have built new trail links to improve trail access and flow. We've created a larger, dirt horse trailer parking lot to accommodate the equestrian use in the park. And we got to open one hour earlier every day this summer. Our park now opens at 7 a.m., which was a big request um, last summer. We presented public programs to educate children and adults about the unique and beautiful resources of the park. Our favorite event this year was the Marmot Fest in July. We had lots of fun activities for the entire family to educate them about the importance of protecting the habitat of the marmots in the park. And we hope to make this an annual event as well. So it's been a great second summer season. We're gearing up for leaf peeper season, which probably should start this weekend. But we're not done, and that's what I'm so excited about. We've received funding for our visitor center, for Phase 2 and the Davis Dams Recreation Project. The visitor center that was planned in Phase 1 has received funding. With the merger of Parks and Wildlife, the visitor center will include offices for both parks and wildlife staff. It will include a small space for interpretive displays, a retail area, and a multi-purpose room for meetings and education programs. And it will provide many of the services that Colorado Parks and Wildlife offers, such as purchasing parks passes, selling fishing licenses, sorry, and purchasing your hunting licenses. We're really excited about this project moving forward, seeing the number one question when people drive into the park is, where is your visitor center? And now we'll actually be able to tell them. So we've also received support for the next phase of development, which is phase two. It adds a maintenance facility, additional parking, additional trails, restrooms, and some of the infrastructure for camping in Phase 3. We have also received support to complete the Davis Ponds Recreation Project. Last fall, the ponds and dams went under re renovation. The dams needed to be built to meet state standards, and that project hopefully will be completed this fall. It's supposed to be done in May. 
Our hope then is to be able to construct trails around the ponds, provide fishing piers for access, a picnic area, and restrooms sometime next year. So that area will become the perfect location to spend the day fishing with your family. Another exciting project is the development of the historic Staunton Ranch District. Back in 2011 and 2012, we went through the application process to have the original 1,720 acres of the ranch designated in National Register of Historic Places. This was a great accomplishment for the park. As you may know, the designation opens doors for grants to help with the preservation of those buildings and also to tell the story of Staunton. As you can see, there's a lot happening in the park, and there's still a lot to do in the future. And before I end, um, seeing as this meeting is dedicated to Mr. Dan Emming, I wanted to share with you his contribution to Staunton State Park. Mr. Emming was a member of the citizen group, which was the Master Planning Advisory Committee that assisted with the master planning process for Staunton. We all believe that without his leadership, an understanding of this community, the park's relationship with its constituents would not be what it is today. Thank you for your time and your continued support. Thank you, Jim. Boy, there's a lot going on around here, isn't there? Um, okay, what's happening at PeaceWorks, Inc., in the Mountain Peace Shelter? Janet Schoen is here um, to dispel some rumors and to let you know what's going on. Hi, I have a, knowing that Angela is usually here with the little timesheets in the back, I prepared a, a video that's exactly five minutes and one second long. So we're going to run that in the background, but I, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you what's on the slides. I'm going to let you read that while I tell you a little bit of a story that I think will give you a, a really good idea of what PeaceWorks is and who we serve. Um, recently, we had a woman who left the shelter after being there three months with her children. When she came to the shelter, her child had called 911 because he had seen years and years of abuse of his mother by his father and he was tired of it. She came because she wanted to protect her children. She came to the Mountain Peace Shelter and was there for three months. When she first arrived, she, her body literally was drawn in. She looked down at the ground. She was afraid to look up. She was a frightened, battered, dejected woman that you could see the lines on her face that showed the pain that she had experienced through her life. When she left the shelter three months later, she had gotten a full ride to Greeley, to the University of Greeley with housing for her family. We were all so excited that in three months a woman's life could change so dramatically that she could provide a really bright future for her children. So what made that happen? It, uh, and this isn't running, so I'm going to run it. Hold on. So it wasn't just the people at the shelter that made that happen, it's people like you. What she didn't know when she left, and she thanked us over and over again for the changes that were made in her life, what she didn't know is that you all, this community, made that happen. Our client advocates helped her to work through all the issues that she was facing when she first came, or a lot of them. Um, they went with her to court, they helped her to navigate the legal system, they helped her understand that she could get victim's compensation, which allowed her money to, for three months to pay for counseling for her children, to pay for basic needs. They helped her go to medical doctors, get food stamps, find um, jobs and information about school. They did job coaching with her and they coached her um, about applying for school. And they, they were there as advocates for her. So that's what the staff did. 
but there was a lot of other people involved in making that change for her life. We had volunteers that came in and did financial education. We had volunteers that came and worked on the shelter and helped create a home-like atmosphere where it was safe for people. We had uh, church groups that provided food, clothing, all sorts of things, as well as the food banks. And they worked with us to get funding for the organization. Right now we have two churches that are doing fundraisers for us. Um, we have a lot of community groups that are donating um, products and services. People are organizations like the Mountain Resource Center, the ECHO, um, the Blue Spruce Habitat for Humanity that we partner with to really try to get resources for these folks. So we have a whole community that's creating a safety net. We have people that donate to us. Um, I want to tell you just right now, we haven't been paid by our grantors in eight weeks because the state of Colorado put in a new accounting system and it was so messed up that none of their grantors have been paid for eight weeks, which means none of us have grantees have been paid for eight weeks. And we went to the community and said, we need help. We really have to pay payroll. We have to pay our bills. Um, it costs a lot of money to, to run a house and to have these kind of programs. And people stepped up, and within two weeks, we've raised $4,000 from people like you who donated on our website. We're so grateful for things like that because I, I actually could get sleep at night and knowing that I could pay the payroll. That was a really good feeling. Um, so we have people that really care. And what I wanted to tell this woman when she left was, it's not us, it's this community. And I want to thank you all for that kind of, for being that kind of community and for being the people that make the changes in the lives of the people that we touch. We um, shelter about 40 women and children every year and we, and we help people, about 150 people in the crisis hotline who are victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and other relationship crimes. So we work with people that you know. One in four women and one in 14 men are victims. So people that you know are being hurt. We, one of the things that I really ask is that you refer people who need help uh, more than anything because we want to be able to help those people and show them what a great community this is and that they can have a new life. I do want to tell you real quick about a taste of the Foothills Fall Family Festival. It is our biggest fundraiser of the year. It is um, on Saturday, October 18th. It's going to be tastings of beer, food, and wine, as well as a lot of really fun family activities. One of the really cool things that um, we just heard about is that a man is going to bring his, thank you, a man is going to bring his um, uh, motor, the, the remote control cars and have a, a track that you can play with the cars and then there's cars that are actually big enough to hold people and so it's going to be really a lot of fun. We're going to have a um, big auction, lots of, of fun family entertainment, so come on by. I think that's it. Thanks. talking about Dan Eming's impact on the Conifer community according to the Mountain, um, Mountain Resource Center. Mary Alice Cohen, who is Operations Director for the Mountain Resource Center, um, is going to be talking first. Mary Alice. Well, first of all, I'd like to share that I feel so privileged and honored to have known Dan. We worked together at the Mountain Resource Center for about five years. And the impact he made on our community um, is just so profound and touching. And um, okay, I'll go ahead and pop this on the slideshow.
You could always see him helping Punky and other volunteers in the food pantry, working with clients, providing food that they might need. Um, he was also in charge of our holiday basket delivery for the whole 285 corridor. And knowing all the roads that he knew so well, he knew where all the families lived. So families that couldn't come to the churches to pick up the holiday baskets, he organized everybody to deliver them to their homes. Um, he also helped organize our resale store. Um, and this was one of the funny things. We asked him, it's kind of hard to see on this uh, annual report, but we asked him to be a model for our annual report. So he just thought that was so funny that we wanted him to be a model. But then when I put that on the, um, excuse me, on the presentation, I realized he was a model in so many other ways for all of us. He, he showed us every day how to really give from your heart and how to make a difference in people's lives. He was so humble and so giving and so generous every day. Uh, so his other job title is job spread, joy, joy spreader. Um, the other thing is, uh, when I went around and talked to people today, they also shared different things beyond his title that just made such a difference. I mean, he really supported us every day. Um, he made every one of us, like probably so many of you here in the room, feel really special and really cared for. Um, his joy was infectious. He always had a smile. Um, and we really, what so many of our volunteers and staff said today is we miss his hugs and we miss um, just the joy that he had. Um, and he'll just be in our hearts forever. So um, I know Dan would want us to share what he was really committed to in making a difference in the community. Um, you'll see our mission here. Um, to provide high quality integrated health and human services that improve the lives of people in our community. And that's what Dan was all about. Um, why do our neighbors need help? Um, really, life can turn on the line. So many of you here know that just in a split second, the bottom can fall out. And so what we see in our community here is people are coming to us because they've had a medical crisis, their child broke their arm and they can't um, they pay the hospital bill, and now they can't pay their rent or their mortgage. Or they've lost their job, or they're working at a retail place and they just can't make a living wage up here. Abandonment is a big one, and I, I know Janet sees this all the time too, where a breadwinner will, of the family just walks out the door, and they no longer have a source of income. Um, or we'll see a teenager who gets kicked out of their grandparents' house who they were residing with, and they're abandoned. So this comes in many different shapes in our community. Mental health issues or other expected life changes. For example, last year, you probably, those of you that have propane, saw the exorbitant increase in the rates. That impacted so many people in our community because they were paying their propane bill, and then they didn't have money for food. And so they had to come and access our food pantry. So that's how we see things in our community of life turning on the dime. So how we help, this is just a real snapshot, but when somebody comes in through our door, they might need help with food, or they might need help with rent, or they might need help looking for a job. So they can come in through any one of these different categories, and we try to wrap around them and help them with whatever else that they might need. So they are most commonly, we see the utility assistance, the food, the firewood ministry that we work with our um, churches with, helping with rent and mortgage. But then, once we get them stabilized, then they might need help with looking at their budget and figuring out how to get out of foreclosure or how they need debt counseling. So we have on-site staff to help with that. Um, a few of you might have taken some of our new computer classes, which are free. We teach Excel and Word and different job searching techniques online. And of course, we have our job fair that we partner with Echo on and um, different one-on-one -on -one job coaching as well as family education and health coverage assistance. Um, and back in the back when you leave, we actually have our menu of services now, which is all of our wraparound services for anybody that you know that might be in need of one of these different types of things. Um, and we couldn't do it without our partners. I was laughing about this picture. You have to picture those as mountains. And those men in really comfy shirts, and then it's our community. So, um, but we offer um, various counseling now, five days a week, um, on site, different practitioners that are serving clients. Empowered, Brian comes and does library story time, our community room. 
with, we have a mammogram coming, we have veteran services, um, and more. And then, as um, Janet mentioned, we couldn't do the work we do without collaborating with Mountain Peace, and with ECHO, and with Habitat for Humanity. We work really closely together to wrap around and support clients with whatever they might need. And how that looks is we work with them to meet their immediate need and stabilize their crisis, and then assess their needs and set their long-term goals, and then provide ongoing success, one minute, woo, and um, celebrate their success. So basically, there's four ways that we would love to help bring in food to the food pantry, groceries, fresh produce, um, and then, of course, donations to our resale store. Um, and then we just got set up with donating your car to charities. And then, of course, like Dan, donating your time to make a difference to help your neighbors in need. So that is everything. Thank you so much for your time and for all you do for our community. Mary Alice, thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, Susan Inning, uh, Dan's wife, is Vice President of Conifer Area Council Board of Directors. And um, Dan often helped us with our town hall meetings or with our adopt a highway cleanups. This is them right there. Um, or just in any way that he could. He volunteered a lot of time at his church, Our Lady of the Pines Catholic Church, and at the Elk Creek Fire Department. And we have Jacob Ware here to talk a little bit about the Elk Creek Fire Department. Jacob. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I was kind of honored when I was asked to come here and talk about Dan and his impact on the fire department. And I'll talk a little bit about what's going on in the fire department. So Dan, as everybody knew and everybody's talked about, he was a very giving person. He joined the fire department in 1979 after the Murphy Gulch fire. He continued on for 30 years at Elk Creek Fire Department. And after that, he continued on in the active retired status. He held the position of lieutenant, captain, Deputy Chief, and also the Wildland Fire Coordinator. He was an important part of wildland fire suppression on the corridor for most of his career. I think every fire on the corridor, he was part of the suppression efforts on it during his career. He, uh, I met him in 2003 when I first joined the fire department. He kind of introduced me to wildland fire. That was my background. He encouraged me. I ended up working for the Forest Service and a number of other things. He was always very helpful. Every single time, he'd always come in. He'd smile. He'd laugh. It didn't really matter what was going on. He always had a joke. He always had some sort of something fun to say. And no matter how bad things got, he'd always smile. He would give you recommendations on his favorite kind of beer that you should probably try. Um, he was just always helpful. The other thing about Dan was he was a constant family man. At the fire department, we have a lot of our volunteers. We have a little saying family, work, and fire department. And Dan always stuck with that. He would come in and we'd talk about fire stuff, blah, 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 and we'd talk about working in the woods or wildland fire or whatever, and he'd always end on a family note. He'd always talk about his kids. Then towards the end of it, we would always end. He'd always tell me, you know, take care of my little boy. I've got a little three-year-old. He was, he was always helpful. It didn't matter what was going on. Um, and that was Dan that we sorely missed. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, what's going on at the fire department right now is through the support of the community, and Dan was a big part of it, we were able to get a mill levy passed, which I think most of you know, and we've slowly been able to uh, uh, surplus some of our aging equipment. We've got, uh, we bought two new fire engines this year, and we're going to have two new water tenders, so we can replace our aging water tenders, which are circa, I think, 1988 and 89. Um, that's probably the biggest thing we've got. The other thing that's going on right now in the fire department is part of our volunteer membership drive. We're trying to get people to come out and volunteer as firefighters. So if you or anybody that you know is interested in volunteering as a firefighter at Elk Creek, please, I've got a table over there, and uh, I'll be around. It is a big time commitment, and that was what was so important about Dan. He did it for years and years. Susan can attest to the amount of meals that are missed just when you sit down to dinner and the pager goes off in the middle of snowstorms, in the middle of the night, my wife will laugh about that for forever, the amount of things that you miss, but it is very rewarding. We always say it's neighbors helping neighbors. So if anybody that you know is interested in volunteering, or if you're interested, please come on by and I can tell you a little bit about it. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. 
We lost another very important community volunteer a while back, Kay Thielen. Many of you knew her. She was a special friend and a Confer Area Council board member. Um, there is now a bench in her memory at Beaver Ranch Community Park in the Celebration Meadow. And this, this is what it looks like. We would like to also honor Dan Inning, another very extraordinary community volunteer with a memorial bench. So any, volunteer, any donations that we get this evening um, will go to that bench. Um, we will also be asking for more funding later. We might even try to do a sign um, along with it. So again, all donations tonight will go towards a memorial bench for Dan Emmy, an extraordinary community volunteer. So thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, we've got lots of information around here, lots of people that you can talk to. And um, then we hope to see you again on November 19th at our next town hall meeting. Thank you so much.